series looking at Daniel. And I just want to recommend the resource as we get started. Um, if you've never been on it, there's an amazing website called The Bible Project. Uh, it's bibleproject.com. We've got incredible summary videos of every book of the Bible. Uh, they pack like really helpful and quite complicated theology into a really simple video, so it's really good to help get your head around what you're looking at in the Bible. And the one for Daniel is particularly helpful, so I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at that. And on that website, the part of their video explains that the central message of Daniel can be summed up in the idea of pattern and promise. So the pattern of Daniel is that humans who are made in the royal image of God to rule on God's behalf, but when humans rebel and make themselves gods, they become like beasts. So that's the pattern. And then the promise is that God will one day confront the beasts and rescue the world and his people and bring his kingdom. So the pattern and the promise. And I highlight that at the start of this morning, because this morning we're going to look at chapters 4 and 5. And these are probably the chapters where certainly the pattern comes out most clearly. So I'm not going to read all the verses, there'll be like 60 odd verses, it take most of the time just to read them all. Um, so I'm going to tell you both stories, and then I will use some of the verses, particularly from chapter 4, but as I explain and unpack more. So King Nebuchadnezzar, if you've been around the last few weeks, you'll be familiar with his name. He was the king of Babylon, the whole Babylonian Empire. He was at a point in his reign where he was doing really well. He'd conquered loads of places and he'd built this incredible kingdom. He was really prosperous, really wealthy, really, really successful. And it would seem at this point just living quite comfortably and enjoying life. But then he has another dream which really troubles him. You might remember he had a dream previously, which we talked about, about a big statue. He has a different dream, and it really troubles him. And in this dream, he saw an enormous tree that grew and grew until it reached the sky. And in fact, this tree kind of filled uh, the whole earth, and you could kind of see it from the ends of the earth. And then a voice spoke into the dream and called out, cut down the tree, but the stump, let the stump remain in the ground. Now, again, loads of people were called, all the magicians, all these wise men were called to try and help him understand the dream, but none of them could fully explain it, apart from, you guessed it, Daniel. So Daniel comes along, and he's really, he's really gutted that he has to explain his dream, and really reluctant to tell the king what it means, uh, but eventually the king kind of encourages him to do it, and he does explain it, and his opening line is, your majesty, you are the tree. It's not really something you ever want to say to the king. They've just had a picture of a tree being cut down. You're the tree. You're the one who's going to be cut down. Obviously not a message you want to share. And Daniel goes on to explain, you're going to be driven away to live with the animals. You'll eat and live like a wild animal. But because the stump remains, your kingdom will be restored when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And Daniel gently advises the king, probably be a good idea at this moment to repent, to renounce your sins, to stop oppressing people, to stop doing all the evil things you're doing, uh, and turn to God. That would probably be a good moment to do that, because maybe, just maybe, God will relent if you do that. And it doesn't happen immediately, but 12 months later, Nebuchadnezzar is looking out over Babylon from his amazing palace, uh, and arrogantly he proclaims that it was his own power that have built all this, and that he built it for his own glory. And immediately there's a voice from heaven, and exactly what was described in this dream takes place. And he ends up going mad and being driven away to live with the animals. It says his nails grew like to be the nails of like bird claws. And it says that he eat grass, ate grass like an ox. And so this happens, but that's not the end of the story. Because later, just as God promised, when he repents, he is restored and he praises and honours God and he's restored to it all his former glory and becomes king again, reigning over the Babylonian Empire. So we're going to focus on that chapter, but I want to quickly tell you, uh, briefly tell you the story of chapter 5 as well, because you really see the pattern. So this is much later, chapter 5. 
This is when Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar is now the king. And Belshazzar is arguably even more arrogant than his father Nebuchadnezzar. There's quite a lot of debate as to whether he was actually Nebuchadnezzar's father, but we won't get into that today. In the middle of a huge party, God gives Belshazzar an incredible warning. So there's, he's praying this huge party, this is an amazing party going on. In the middle of the party, suddenly a hand appears, just a hand, no body, no arm, no anything else, just a hand, and starts writing on the wall. This is the story where you get the praise from, the writing on the wall. And uh, Daniel, it turns out, is the only one who can explain the words in this writing. By this point, Daniel had been sidelined. He wasn't a big deal in Belshazzar's kingdom. Um, and so it takes them quite a while till they get to Daniel, because he tried basically everyone else first to try and interpret these words. But eventually, they remember about Daniel. He gets called, and he can explain the words. And Daniel explains the warning of the words, um, but also Daniel explains that Belshazzar should have known better. He'd basically already been warned because he'd seen what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He'd watched that happen, so he should have known that he needed to be careful to not get too arrogant and too big in himself. And with Belshazzar, that very night, he is slain, and that's the end of the Babylonian Empire because Darius the Mede then takes over, and that's the beginning of the Medo Persian Empire. So, there you go, two stories, quite brutal, particularly the end of the second one. We'll focus in on the first one. But there's incredible imagery in these two stories, and some of the imagery is quite clearly drawn uh, from the Genesis creation account of men and women, uh, men and women, and also from Psalm 8, which has similar pictures of how God created the world, particularly in regard to how God made us in his image, how he made men and women in the image of himself. And this is where we kind of really see that pattern that we spoke about at the start, that humans are made in the royal image of God to rule on God's path. But when humans rebel and make themselves gods, they uh, make themselves beasts. So it's easy, I think, to see that pattern repeating throughout history in a, in a bigger sense uh, without making any political comment. I think you can see some of that kind of thing playing out right now, as you see the kind of Israel and Gaza situation. You can see it playing out when you think of the Russia-Ukraine situation, with perhaps a more similar dynamic with one person at the, at the top, who's maybe in a more Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar type position of making themselves gods in the Russia-Ukraine situation. And it's easy so it's easy to see all of that in terms of the bigger sense of world events. You can look back throughout history and see that kind of pattern repeating itself. And I think it'd be easy just to leave it there. But actually, I think for every single one of us, there's danger in success that leads to a comfortable life. The danger of success that leads to a comfortable life. How often do you see it in uh, footballers or sports stars who start out really strong in their career but don't seem to be able to handle all the fame, the wealth, the luxury. For some of them, it seems that life is just too much fun, that they never push on to the fullness of their talent. Um, and you see it, sadly, a pattern like that play out in Christian lives as well, I think, in the Western world. Again and again, you see Christians start strong. Perhaps someone gives their life to Jesus at quite a young age. They're really, really passionate for him. And in the early years, they did like, very, very passionately for Jesus. But they get a job, and it goes all right at first, they're still pretty passionate for Jesus. Um, and maybe they start a family, maybe they don't. But as all these things kind of add up, and perhaps particularly in terms of career, fin um, career progression and financial prosperity, as that kind of increases and life gets more and more comfortable, there's almost an exact tracking with the cooling down of faith. Not necessarily ever giving up on Jesus, but it just becomes less and less important and less and less necessary to life because you've kind of got everything you need without Jesus. And I just want to be really clear, totally possible uh, to pursue a career and do that while remaining full on passionate for Jesus. Totally possible to be really wealthy and own Jesus and worship him and glorify him. It's just a general pattern that you can quite often and sadly more common than even you'd like see happen. And just before Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, it says this in uh, Daniel 4.4, because I just want to show you that this isn't just kind of something I'm reading into the Bible here, this is really here. 
It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. So you can see how before all this happened, he was just content, he was just happy with all the wealth he had. He was kind of artificially happy with the life circumstances he found himself in. He found a kind of false security in the situation he was in. But I think we can all be prone to this danger if we experience some kind of success in our career. If we're doing quite well financially, perhaps we've just been promoted lots of times, or perhaps we've started something that's gone really well. And I think the danger here is that in our society, it's easy to think, oh, that's not me, because I'm not like uber successful. But actually, most of us in this nation are successful and prosperous on a kind of world standard kind of level. And also, the danger here isn't just the success and the prosperity, because there's not actually anything wrong with any of that. And sometimes that's what God actually calls us to do, to expand his kingdom by being successful in various areas of society. But the danger here is when that leads us into an easy, comfortable life. And sometimes you don't actually have to do that well to feel successful enough to kind of feel you kind of earn the comfort that you find in your life. Feel like you've earned that sense of ease and taking it a little bit easy. I've got a really challenging, this really hit me when I read it earlier in the week, quite from uh, Ronald Wallace, who's written a commentary on Daniel. He says, prosperity and success are always dangerous if they lead to ease. And they're especially dangerous for those of us who believe in God. But the temptation always is to imagine that our very prosperity and success are signs that God is especially pleased with us and for us to delude ourselves into a false sense of happiness and security which diverts us from having to face the possibly unbearable truth about ourselves. He goes on to unpack the kind of various varieties of what that unbearable truth might look like. So being successful in life, doing all right financially, having a comfortable life, aren't signs that God's especially pleased with us. You know, it's really important to get this, because like, think about it. Like, comparison's not normally helpful, just to say, but well, I'm going to do a bit of comparison on a bigger scale, not to anyone specific. If you think about it around the world today, there are loads and loads of Christians living in abject poverty. poverty. Do you really think that God's more pleased with us? than he is with them. The answer to that one's really obvious. But this thing is subtle, isn't it? It creeps up in our hearts in a much more subtle way. It's not as obvious as I've just put it. See, the enemy, he loves to veil our eyes and trick us into thinking that we're doing really well in life because anything that can trick us into us feeling comfortable, us feeling content, us feeling like we're doing well, apart from Jesus, is his goal. If you can't stop us from actually following Jesus, he would love us to be content about everything, but with Jesus out of the picture. He would love us to be so comfortable that we don't need to get to Jesus in the morning. That we don't need to make our, like when we get up in the morning, we're like, I don't even have to think about it, because my life is okay as it is. The thing that the enemy hates is when we have to rely on God day by day. When we have to come to him moment by moment, uh, like we have to come to Jesus afresh every morning and be like, I cannot get through this day without you. That's the sign of someone that the enemy is going to be really scared of because God is at work in their life because they know that they need Jesus. And actually, it is possible to live like that even in the seasons of our life when things are going quite well. Even in the seasons of life when things are actually quite comfortable, it is possible to still choose to get to God, to still choose to rely on Him rather than the comfort and the ways we, the place we found ourselves in. So let, let's just really try and hit this one home before we move on to a different point. If we're being really honest with ourselves, when we're doing well in life, is there any part of our hearts where we think, I deserve this, I learned this, God must be pleased with me? Do you know what? I'll let you into a secret. God is pleased with you. He's really pleased with you. He's totally delighted in you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He is so pleased with you. But it is not because of anything you've done. It's not because you're good at your job. 
It's not because you're being a good Christian and remembering to read your Bible every morning. It's only because of Jesus and for absolutely no other reason. It's only because of him. I'll come back to that question that I've just asked again at the end because I think it's a really important one for us to check our hearts on. Secondly, God's loving patience with us. So after having the dream, uh, it's a full year before Nebuchadnezzar turned mad and went to live with the animals. I think that's an incredible, incredible expression of God's patience. If God can be patient with King Nebuchadnezzar, who was an utterly brutal person, who made an empire in brutality, really, and uh, conquering people and using all kinds of horrible practices to further his empire, if God can be patient with him, he can be patient with anyone. God's loving patience with us. So God gave uh, Daniel, uh, gave Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, a chance to repent and change. And this is what God said to him through Daniel. He said, therefore, your majesty, please be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to be oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. You know, God is so loving and kind in how he deals with us. He's had to be so gentle with me. The number of times I've had like pride issues in my life or issues where I've, in my heart I just know what I've been being really judgy about other people. There would be classic examples in my life where I've been stubborn about admitting that it's really there, kind of justifying my judgment of like, no, like I'm being discerning a bit and all that went really on my feet down my heart. I'm just being judgy. I'm being stubborn about dealing with it. But God's so kind. He's so patient in the way that he's dealt with me. But the challenge is, you see, God's kindness it is meant to lead us to repentance. And when we go, of course, in life, when we sin, and sin is not just doing stuff wrong, it's, it's like what Nebuchadnezzar was doing here and making himself God, saying, I'm God and you're not making yourself God of your own little empire. When we sin in our lives, when we get our life gets full of pride, uh, whatever it might be, the, the general pattern of our loving Father, he can work however he wants, but the general pattern, the general way he seems to work, is that he'll start gently. And he starts gently by getting our attention about something that we need to deal with in our lives. It might be that he speaks to us directly. It might be like Nebuchadnezzar, you might get a dream, a woman you did. It might be that you read something in the Bible. You know when you read something in the Bible and you think, my life really doesn't add up to that? That's a sign that you should get on your knees <laughs> and deal with stuff in your life then and there, because God might be speaking to you in that moment. It might be that God speaks to you through the advice of a good friend. Or even more challenging, it might be that he speaks to you through the advice of someone you really don't like very much, but they're giving you really good advice, and God is speaking into your life at that moment. It might be that just you get a sense of something in your life that you need to deal with. When these things happen, the best thing to do is to take the opportunity to get on your knees, confess your sin, say, God, I'm sorry, and repent because he loves to forgive and deal with it while he's doing it gently. Taking the opportunity to remember that God is God and we're not. Nebuchadnezzar, you see, he ignored God's patient, more gentle warning. It wasn't really just this one. He'd been warned already multiple times if you've been with us over the last week. He forgot about the dream. So it says in Daniel 4, 29, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, he said, is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Like when you hear it, can you just like think of anyone saying that? It's just so arrogant, isn't it? It's just the level of arrogance is just so out there. And the palace he was in, this is a picture of it here, is actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient worlds, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And he had built this palace, and so he was standing in his palace overlooking Babylon, saying, isn't this amazing what I've built? Isn't this incredible what I've done? Aren't I amazing? No one else could possibly have done all of this amazing stuff. And he started thinking, that he was the only one, that he was the one. He started lifting himself above God, in effect. And as soon as he said that, a voice from heaven spoke to him. And he was sent out into a wilderness, and exactly what had said would happen from the dream happened. He became like a wild animal. He was driven out to live with the animals, eating grass. So the thing is, Russ, God's so, so patient with us, but he's not gonna let us get stuck. 
you've given your life to following Jesus, if you've said that Jesus is your Lord, that he's your boss, that you're going to follow him wherever he takes you, he is going to finish the work that he started in you in terms of transforming you to make you more and more like his son. He is going to see that free. It says in the New Testament, Hebrews 12, 4 to 7, it says this, if you're struggling against sin, you've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It's referring to Jesus who resisted sin to the point of death on the cross on our behalf. Not for his sin, but for our sin. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, and this is quoting the Old Testament, quoting Proverbs, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as a son or daughter. You know, like the men in Christian, male Christians, we have put up with being called the bride of Christ. So sometimes when it says son, it does also mean daughter in the Bible. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? So God is a loving father. Good earthly parents discipline their children. And discipline here, by the way, probably is being used as a kind of larger term, referring, it was often used to kind of refer to a bigger sense to what it looked like to raise a child. So it involved, yes, maybe correction, but also the kind of sense of teaching, instruction, that kind of wider sense of training a child and bringing them up. It's, it's probably bigger than just the correction idea in the word here. And when we go through hard times and challenges in life, it's really important that you get this bit. It's very dangerous to think that God's not pleased with you. Just like it's really dangerous to think God's really pleased with you when you're doing well, equally it's really dangerous to think that God's not pleased with me when I'm not doing well. God loves you consistently all the time because of Jesus. He loves you wholeheartedly. He's for you. He's pleased with you. He's delighted in you because he looks at the work of Jesus, not the work of your life. However, we are encouraged to endure hardship as discipline, as training, as instruction, as teaching over our life, as correction at times. God is treating you as his child, but what children are not disciplined by their father? So for me, when I was ill earlier this year in the hospital for a period of time, uh, I didn't see that as God being unhappy with me or punishing me in some way. But I did think and did assume that God had things that he wanted to teach me through it. And that there were things in it that were going to grow me, to train me, to shape me. Um, And I think he taught me lots of things. One of the things that I learned was about not being in control. About how it was alright if I didn't know everything that was going on in church, for example. It was alright. Uh, even to more simple things, if I needed to ask for help <laughs> with very simple tasks in life. Because you know what? God was still in control. He was still in control, even when I wasn't. And I learned lots of other things as well. I've just given you one example. I'm not sure I'd have learned those things if I wasn't intentionally thinking in this time, God's going to be teaching me some things for it. If I've got trapped in the cycle of thinking, oh, like, oh no, what have I done in my life that I've ended up here? What, what have I done that God's punishing me like this? I don't think I'd have learned those things. Or if I've come into it just thinking that like, God only blesses and does good to his children, like, with a, an assumption that there's no pain to walk through for the Christian, I think I'd have struggled to learn those lessons. So while we often won't know the course, We often, this side of glory, won't know why we've gone through various pains and trials and challenges in our life. We can endure hardship as discipline, as teaching, as training. We can fight to keep our hearts in good shape and not lose heart and trust that actually purpose in the pain that we're walking through. There is actually things that God's doing and shaping us. And sometimes it is really, really hard to see that in the middle of it all. I get that. I really do. But trust that God is working. Keep seeking him, keep asking him what the lessons he might be teaching you are. Finally, I want to look at restoration and rescue. 
So there's a repeating sentence in chapter 4 that helps us see the lesson that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn. Uh, and that sentence is this. Um, so you first see it in Daniel 4.17, but we also see it in 25 and 31. Um, and it's that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone with whom he wishes. As this is quite clearly the big point that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn. It's like really clearly highlighted. You don't have to be a Bible commentator. You just have to read the passage twice to see that this is like a repeating thing. Um, and finally, at the end, we see that Nebuchadnezzar had learned his lesson and he lifted his eyes and he praises God like this. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor returned to me, the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right. All his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So finally, Nebuchadnezzar had learned his lesson. We don't know for sure whether Nebuchadnezzar went on living his life as a believer in God or not, but I like to see this as the point where Nebuchadnezzar really did turn to God, where his life really did turn around. And you even get that impression that there was an ongoing transformation from the way that his he, the rest up until this point in Daniel, he seems quite a lonely character. But suddenly you get these nobles and other people coming to seek him out and seek out his advice. It seems that some it's a kind of genuine transformation had taken place in him. So God really is in control of everything. He is sovereign. The word that you say sovereign just means that he's Lord over all creation. He's the boss of it all. He really is in control of everything. And the certainty that God is in control in chapter 4, I think, points us towards the promise of the overall book of Daniel. The promise is maybe seen clearly, more clearly in other chapters, but it points us towards that sense of promise that God will one day confront the beast and rescue the world. And actually, God's already started doing that in the coming of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, the ultimate example of what humanity looks like, in Jesus, God has confronted the beast. And the beast, it's importantly clear, the beast is not like individual humans. It's the one behind that beast-like behavior in humans. It's the enemy, it's Satan, it's the devil. And Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. He took on Satan's sin and death at the cross and he won. What looked like defeat was actually victory. And anyone who trusts Jesus, who makes him Lord, who humbly acknowledges that he's in control, can know the rescue of Jesus even here and now. We can know Jesus coming to live in our hearts, we can know what it is to be restored to a relationship with our Father God. And we can know the certainty of that because the Holy Spirit comes and lives in our hearts and assures us that we're his children. But we can also be certain that one day Jesus will return again and his kingdom, which is going to keep on growing and growing until Jesus returns again, will be the only kingdom that matters. So we've been looking at this pattern and promise idea that we see through all that, out of the whole of Daniel, but I wanted in at least one of these talks to make that clear, to help you get a bigger picture of Daniel. A few questions to help us land as we wrap up. First one is, have you given your life to Jesus? To follow Jesus, to, to be a Christian, is simply uh, to admit that Jesus is Lord, that he's boss, and that you're happy for him to be the boss over your life is to believe that Jesus died and that he rose again. Not just in a, a general sense, but to actually believe that's happened so that you can be restored to a relationship with Father God. If you've never given your life to Jesus before, you're really welcome to do that this morning. In fact, there's opportunity as well. If you just want to know more about it, we're very happy to talk more about it with you. But we'd love to chat with you at the end, pray with you at the end if that's you. And for all of us this morning, there's a chance 
to examine our hearts afresh. I'm just going to ask Alex and Charlotte to come up and um, get ready for us to sing again in a moment. But as a chance at this point for us to examine our hearts afresh, I think if I'm being really honest, my biggest failures in life, they probably come when I've had an overinflated view of my abilities when my ego's got too big, when I've had t too big a picture of who I am. And my biggest successes in life have probably come when I've had a healthy view of my own weaknesses combined with a really big view of who God is. Knowing that though I am weak, God is strong. So two questions to help us with that as we land. The first one is the one we had before. If we're being really honest with ourselves, when we're doing well in life, is there any part of our hearts where we think, I deserve this, I've earned this, God must be pleased with me. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar then found freedom when he realised that he was meant to live for something bigger than himself, something bigger even than his huge Babylonian empire. He found freedom when he realised he was meant to live for God and his kingdom, and not himself and his own kingdom. So are we living for something bigger than ourselves? Are we living for Jesus and his kingdom? Or really, is it more about me and my kingdom? Because in a weird sort of way, if we're not living for God's kingdom, that's really what we're building for. It might not be put in quite such stark terms as King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a bit more subtle in the modern day Western world, the little empires that we build for ourselves. So a couple of challenging questions there. I just want to emphasize as well, I just feel, this isn't in my notes at all, but just feel prompted to just be really clear again. When we think of this idea of like, are we doing things because I've earned it, because God must be pleased with me, God really is very pleased with you. The point isn't that God's not pleased with you. He's absolutely delighted in you. The point is, you thinking that you've earned that kind of approval because of what you've done, because of your success. 